You're listening to the newest episode of Life Equals Choices, Choices Equal Life with your host, Kim Olver. This is Kim, and welcome back to Season 2 of Life Equals Choices, Choices Equal Life. I hope you were able to catch up with past episodes and perhaps listen again to some of your favorites during our two-week break. I'm happy to be back at it, and this month our focus is on coaching. In this, our 40th episode, I specifically want to talk about coaches in their role of hope warrior. I find there are typically two main reasons people main reasons people hire a coach. Either they're attempting to reach a goal or they want to get rid of some pain. Both scenarios require the coach to don their hope warrior hat. This role is often one that distinguishes a coach from many counselors. For the first category of people, those attempting, those attempting to reach a goal that has been out of grasp, a coach serves as a beacon, lighting the way. This is why Section C2 of the Board Certified Coach Ethical Code is, quote, recognize the limits of coaching practice and qualifications and provide services only when qualified. Certificates and applicants are responsible for determining the limits of their competency based on education, knowledge, experience, credentials, and other relevant considerations, close quote. It would be unethical for a coach to be coaching you on weight loss, for example, if they hadn't had education, training, or experience with losing or maintaining weight. Clients in this first category are often seeking coaches who have had success in whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. They would probably also want to see some social proof that you have had success with other clients accomplishing the same goal. Meeting these requirements will provide the hope your client is looking for. If they haven't been successful with their goal up to the point of hiring you, they likely think you can provide them something that will make its realization possible. Providing this sense of hope is imperative to the clean relationship. Conversely, it would be highly unethical to provide a false sense of hope just to land a client. You must believe your client is capable of accomplishing their goal and that you have the knowledge and skills to help them get there. For the second group, those trying to escape a painful escape, a painful situation, hope is also needed. This can be one of the things that distinguishes coaching from counseling. Because counseling is well steeped in a medical disease model way of thinking, once a person has a psychiatric diagnosis, it's as if their brain can be labeled with a DSM-5 diagnosis. Now they have a name for what's wrong with them. And I put that in parenthetical quotation marks. From my perspective, there's nothing wrong with them except that they've developed behaviors that are making their lives painful. If the person experiencing that pain wants to explore where that all comes from or wants to sit with a counselor in the pain of their trauma, they want counseling not coaching. However, if a person recognizes that their, quote, psychiatric symptoms, unquote, are simply behaviors they choose to manage a challenging situation situation in their lives, they can realize that they aren't broken. Something difficult, bad, and sometimes even horrific happened to them, and they developed their behavior as a coping mechanism. This means they're strong, not wrong. They did an absolutely heroic thing, heroic thing in the midst of a crisis in their life. Those behaviors were the best they had at that time, but time has passed and they likely aren't in that situation anymore and their behaviors are hurting them now more than they're helping. When they want relief without rehashing all the pain they've been living through, been living through coaching is for them. When a person approaches a coach in pain, They need hope that the coach has the education, training, and experience to help them be able to reduce or eliminate that pain. Again, social proof of success or your story of recovering from whatever situation. As coaches, it's our job to show our clients that there is hope. They need to know that emotional pain is temporary and or that there is an ordered path to accomplish their hopes and dreams. In this way, coaches are hope warriors. 
Being a hope warrior is no easy task, easy task, as there are many pitfalls we can succumb to. The first one is faking it. I believe an experienced client has a fairly active BS meter, and if you're faking hope for a client, this will readily be apparent. Hope isn't something you should try to fake. If you don't, if you don't believe you can help your client achieve the results they want, then you're doing them a disservice and should refer to someone else. It's acceptable to have moments of doubt. We're all human after all. But if these doubts persist, get supervision. And if all else fails, either pause coaching if you coaching if you believe your client isn't ready for change or refer to someone else. The second pitfall is allowing our clients to convince us their situation is, in fact, hopeless. You must protect against falling for this trap. When we allow our clients to drone on about all the reasons they can't, or most likely won't, be able to do anything about their current situation, the worst thing we can do as a hope warrior is believe them. I know when I begin to feel hopeless in a session with a client, I use that emotion as a wake-up call for me. I have allowed my client to convince me they're in a hopeless, helpless situation. Since I believe there's always a choice, and there's always something else we can try, then I know I have absorbed a little too much of my client's emotions. When you take on the role of hope warrior, you know there is always hope. Even if the client have exactly what they want, you can work together to get them more of what they need so they'll feel better about their life. The third pitfall is allowing your own challenges to enter the coaching relationship. Coaches are not superhumans. We experience sickness, death, dis disappointments, betrayal, hurt, pain, and anger, just like everybody else. When we as coaches enter a coaching session still reeling, raw, and bleeding from something that's happened in our lives, we may not be able to maintain the hope warrior role for our client. When, when you're in a coaching session, it's important to bring your best self into that helping relationship. Check yourself for negativity. Are you feeling stuck yourself? Are you carrying unresolved sadness, anger, or fear? Are you preoccupied by things having nothing having nothing to do with your client? Claiming a hope warrior title doesn't mean you never experience painful emotions. However, if you're a mental freedom coach, you won't stay in those painful emotions long because you know what you need to do to transform that pain into something neutral or even pleasant. This is the very skill you want to help your clients develop. When you find yourself less than your best, there are four choices available to you. You can continue with your session, letting your pain seep in. You can continue the session with great discipline to remain present with your client without allowing your thoughts to drift to your own personal challenge. You can postpone sessions until you do the work to transform your pain, or you can get that work done before entering your session. In being a hope warrior and an ethical coach, you wouldn't choose the first option, but the other three would be a responsible ethical choice. Modeling the things you're teaching your clients is another way to demonstrate hope. You're teaching your clients that the skills you're sharing with them will serve them for a lifetime. It also shows you have successful experience with the skills and you genuinely use the things you share with them. You are teaching your client that the skills you're sharing with them will serve them for a lifetime. It also shows you have successful experience with the skills and you genuinely use the things you share with them. This does not mean you, this does not mean you never empathize with your client when they're in pain. Clients won't care about any of the skills you want to share with them until you've established a need-satisfying relationship. Part of doing that includes listening attentively to your client's story. In order for them to help you for them to help you know and understand them, they're probably going to want to tell you how they got where they are. They want you to know about their story and it would be disrespectful and irresponsible for you not to oblige them at least once. 
You don't have to listen to the same story multiple times, though, about them. But once you know, it can be re-traumatizing to allow them to repeat it over and over. Leave that work for counseling. As a coach, you are quickly trying to focus your client's attention on the areas where they have power and control. This is where their hope lies. Staying focused on the painful stuff and the corresponding worry that it could happen again or that it has permanently marred them in some way does the opposite of instilling hope. This sets your client up for the hopeless, helpless, and worthless triad, something that sucks the life out of otherwise, out of otherwise positive individuals. Your client will be encouraged to know you've been where they are, and they will clearly see that you built a life after the challenges. Don't be afraid to share an abbreviated version of your story. Your client doesn't need your details, just give, just give them the brief version so they can see you tell your story without all the emotionality and pain. You've worked through it and come out on the other side. This will provide the hope they need. If you don't have your own personal story, it's acceptable to speak of former clients in general and the challenges they overcame and the results they created with your coaching. It's acceptable to speak of former clients in general and the challenges they overcame and the results they created with your coaching. This is another way to provide hope. Sometimes clients are feeling hopeless and disempowered because they're upset about someone else's choices. They may even talk with you about coaching someone else so they can end the other person's misery. I have a client right now who's talking to me about hiring me to coach her husband. Twice I've had daughters attempt to hire me to coach parents try to hire me to coach their children. This is a complicated situation, and I'm not saying the husband, daughter, and children wouldn't benefit from coaching. But one of the things that's necessary for a good coaching experience is for the client to be open and amenable to coaching. Without a, person's in, without a person's internal desire to change something in their lives, coaching will be unsuccessful and likely frustrating for both the client and the coach. The way I work to provide hope in these situations is to help the person accept the fact that they can only change their own behavior. They can't change anyone else's how good the change might be for the other person. Everyone, including the husband, the mothers, and the kids, are doing the best they know to do to get what they want in that moment. The hope comes from helping clients focus on the one person they have power and control to change. It's sometimes challenging to come with coaching is them, because they are the one I'm talking to. I also work to help clients understand that if they're upset about a loved one's behavior, particularly when that person is seemingly all right with their choices, then they are the ones who own the problem, since they're the most upset by it. And consequently, and consequently then, they're responsible for the solution. I provide the hope that if they can make their own changes to learn to accept the behavior of others, the other's behavior will likely change. I can't predict in what direction, but relationships are always part of a systemic machine. When you alter one aspect of how that machine works, other parts of the machine need to adapt to those changes. When a client is putting their mind, heart, body, and soul into changing someone else to no avail, helplessness and hopelessness is often the result. Some may even double down on their efforts to change the other person, causing even deeper helplessness and hopelessness. Helping a client realize this is futile and not an effort worth their energy frees them to do the empowering work, accepting others and changing themselves. Another related way to provide hope is in the area of victimization. Sometimes clients are convinced they are victims of circumstances, their personality, their past, or another person. It can be extremely hopeful to realize that except in the case of actual physical assault, no one can victimize you without your mental permission. People are in control of what they are victimized by. Of course, people get hurt all the time and it can be excruciatingly painful 
But what most people don't realize is they're causing that pain. It's not the, ex it's not the external cause they think it is. When people say hurtful things, there are things you can do to mitigate the effects of those things. This is incredibly hopeful to understand and even more powerful when implemented. Sometimes as a coach, you need to believe in your client's ability to be successful, to be successful until they have the experiences they need to experience success on their own. The last thing I want to mention regarding hope is to assess your client and respond accordingly. Some clients are capable of taking giant leaps in the direction they want to go. To go. Others need to use the baby step method and some are in between these two extremes. Evaluate where your client is on this continuum and proceed at the proper pace for your client. It's important to have a strategy that will be a stretch for your client, but not so easy. It's a no-brainer. Creating a moderate amount of anxiety is most helpful when change is involved. When a person's goals don't scare them a little bit, they probably aren't worth pursuing. The plan should arouse some anxiety, but not so much the client is too scared to start, while at the same time it shouldn't be so easy the client wonders why bother. Your job is to create hope that the plan will work with consistent action and that you're there to help the client adjust whatever needs to be adjusted to continue moving in the direction of the goal or away from the pain. Clients can lean on your hope until they develop their own through a of successful efforts, bringing them closer to the goal they're trying to reach. In summary, there are eight ways you can become a hope warrior for your clients. One, the first way is to simply be competent in your area of coaching. Have education, experiences, and success in the things your client is working to change. Two, be authentically confident in your ability to help your client or refer them. Never pretend to be something you're not. Three, don't allow yourself to get, self to get stuck in your client's hopelessness. You must remain steadfastly hopeful even when your client can't find any of their own. Four, do not allow your personal challenges to intrude into the coaching session. Prior to working with a client, always check in with yourself for your ability, objective, and completely focused on your client and their issues. Five, be a transparent role model of the skills you're honing with your clients. Six, help them gain hope by focusing their time, energy, and attention on things they have the power to change instead of spending their precious resources trying to control the uncontrollable. 7. Teach hope in overcoming the hopelessness of victimization. They may have been victimized, but they do not have to absorb the victim role. 8. Allow them to build their hope with a plan that matches the pace they're comfortable with. If you're interested in learning more about being a hope warrior, please check out the coaching programs at academyofchoice.com. If you would like to experience coaching with one of Academy of Choice's Hope Warriors, check out the pages at www.therelationshipcenter.biz. I hope you enjoyed today's show and that you'll return next week when the title of my show is Coaching Explained 101. I'm looking forward to it. Talk with you then. This has been another thought-provoking episode of Life Equals Choices, Choices Equal Life. To listen to past episodes, please visit our website at www.therelationshipcenter.biz forward slash podcast. And remember to subscribe. And remember to subscribe.